Hi, thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited to have you here. You know, more and more people are joining every night to learn about today's challenging times and the great message of hope that the Bible offers. Now to share this message even further, I'd like to ask you to share it with as many people as you can, people who have a desire to learn more about today's events and what the Bible has to say about them. You know they will be blessed. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens, and God bless you. This is Hope Awakens. Thanks for being part of an epic journey of discovery as we look for and find answers to the most important questions we could be asking right now. We're all very much affected by what's going on in the world at this moment. Is it something that has eternal ramifications? Is it of biblical significance? And how can we make it through this thing in one piece with our hope intact and with our confidence for the future strong? We're finding out together. And I hope you've been encouraged so far. I want to say hi to Michelle. Michelle is in Newport Center, Vermont, a stone's throw from the Canadian border on the banks of Lake Memphrey Magog. Greetings to friends in Flagstaff, Arizona, Mason, Mesa, Arizona, Carson, Washington, on the banks of the Columbia River, Sherwood Park in Alberta, Canada. Hi to our friends watching in French Polynesia. Sharon is watching in Malawi, Africa. Greetings to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Bula Vinaka, to our friends watching on the island of Vanuolevu in beautiful Fiji. And a very special welcome to Mabel from Boyne City, Michigan, who today turns 99. Happy birthday, Mabel. Great to have you with us. We are discovering there is hope in the moment. Thanks for being part of Hope Awakens.
I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written, and this is Hope Awakens. I hope you're doing well, staying well, navigating these challenging times in the belief that we're going to be looking back on this someday, and we hope someday soon. But at the same time, we realize there are even bigger things going on in the world, behind the scenes, as a great spiritual battle plays out. Tonight, we'll look at one of the great privileges God has given the entire human family. We will welcome a special guest, and in a moment, we'll start with your questions. A reminder first, be sure to go to hopeawakens.org, where you'll find resources, previous presentations, the opportunity to send a prayer request. Make sure you go this evening to hopeawakens.org, and if you haven't done so already, do register. I have a special book to give you called God's Eternal Sign. It's under the Resources tab. If you haven't received the previous special gift books, check out your spam folder in your email. My Hope Awakens associates have been emailing you. If you haven't got these resources, maybe your computer is sending it to spam, and that would be too bad. But be sure tonight that you register, and that's how you'll get this God's eternal sign. We're not emailing that one. You're getting it by dint of having registered. Now, you can listen in English or you can watch in ASL, American Sign Language. Be sure that you let someone you know, if you know someone who speaks ASL, sign language, that these presentations are in sign language. Go to hopeawakens.org and you find in the, right in the middle of the page, there's a button that will say ASL and you watch right about there. Also at hopeawakens.org, you can submit your questions. So to ask your questions, here is Doug Na. Doug, welcome. Hey, John. It's always good to be here every night. And every night, we're always getting good questions. And so let's get right into them. Uh, this is the first question. My husband and I come from two different faith backgrounds. When we were married, we weren't really serious about God. But now I am. And my husband doesn't like it when... I want to take my children to church. How do I lead my husband and my children into a saving relationship with Jesus? Oh, that's a very good question. And that's a very important question. Here's what you do. You pray. You pray. You invite kindly. You witness gently. You let Jesus be seen in your life. Understand you are not responsible for your family members being saved and finding Jesus. But what God does want you to do is let your light shine. Now, keep this in mind. It might help you with your patience level. The husband you have today is the gentleman you married back there in the beginning. You got what you paid for. You've changed and grown. He's back there, but that's where he was when you married him. So be gracious, be kind. I'm not suggesting that we ought to overlook anything that shouldn't be overlooked. But remember, these tensions will exist, and it's really kind of a challenge. But pray, witness, be kind. Invite them to come to the Christmas program and whatever you might have at church. Things where you can build bridges and break down any barriers. In one of the resources that you recommended, it talks about how Jesus looks through the books of records to see how a person chose, whether for him or against him. And then God honors that choice. That sounds like once saved, always saved. Is, am I misunderstanding something? Yeah, I think you might be. I think you might be misunderstanding something there. In the judgment, God doesn't look at one choice you made when you were 10 years old or 20 years old. He's looking at the accumulation of choices you made with your life. What choice did your life make? So he honors the, 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 the life of choice. He offers your life's decision, not some decision you made back there or there or there. You know, I have trouble studying with people who refuse to study in any other way but the contextual way. They refuse to believe it or they refuse to study the line upon line, precept upon precept way. Is it OK to study in the contextual way and also in the topical way? Yeah, sure it is. Absolutely. Now, your first responsibility to the text is to study in context. That's absolutely important. Yeah, things were written in context and they should be understood in context. But it's OK to study topically as well. Now, if your friends want to study contextually, then meet the challenge. It'll be good for them and it'll be good for you. How do you know if God loves you? After all, God said in the Bible, Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. This frightens me. Yeah. How do you know God loves you? Um, for the Bible tells me so. Have you ever heard that said or sung or, 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 or something or other? Jesus loves me this I know. For God so loved the world. 
That's it. That's all you need. It says it. It settles it. Now, uh, it says that that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Now, Jesus said, you got to uh, hate your mother and father and so on. If you don't, you're not worthy of him. The Bible says that Jacob loved, wasn't it, Rachel and hated Leah. This isn't hate in the sense of hate. It means uh, uh, preferred less. It certainly does not mean that God detested Esau. It's simply saying that God loved the one and the other one, you know, he looked at differently and not because there was a different love in God's heart, but because of circumstances and actions. God chose Jacob, uh, even though he was the second born, he came first. Uh, he didn't despise Esau at all. So look at the way that word hate is used through the Bible and you will see that God does not mean that there were these people that he, he, he sticks pins and dolls, that sort of thing. That's not going on. Did the heavenly sanctuary exist before creation? Yes, it did. No question. Wesley would like to know, the Bible says that God is against pride. Yet I hear people say, I'm proud of my child. I'm proud of my nephew. I'm proud of my niece. Is there something wrong with that? Or are we talking about a different form of pride? No, no, no. Pride is okay, but not that pride. Well, yes, I think that's the case. The Bible is against pride. Pride is an abomination. That self-centered, self-loving pride, that's not good. But if you've got a niece or nephew, they're good at the cello or they run well or they're arty, you can, you can feel good, uh, positive human pride about that. There's no problem at all. If the Holy Spirit's role is to dwell in us after Jesus went, in, went to heaven, what was his role before that? Well, the Holy Spirit spoke and led and influenced and anointed. You will remember that Saul was anointed by the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. Today, the Holy Spirit brings to you the personal presence of Jesus. That's something different because Jesus hadn't bodily come to the world back then. So that's the difference between then and now. Here's what we're going to do. We have a, a, an, a live question coming to us from Washington State. Kimberly and her son Trevor, I believe, are about to join me from somewhere in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Hey, guys, how are you doing this evening? Good. Doing well. I'm glad to hear it. Thanks for joining me. Now, you have a question or two. Fire away. Let's yeah. see how I can do with this. Well, my first one is, when God comes again, will blind people well, um, see God even though they're blind? Well, my second I I'm going to take the one first because if you give me too many at one time, I'm sure I won't be able to uh, handle it. Revelation 1 and verse 7, Trevor, great question, says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Well, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be very noisy. Does that mean that the deaf will hear him? You know what I think? I think so. Now, this is just me. If I'm wrong, well, I guess we'll find out on the day. But my expectation is that even the blind will see Jesus when Jesus comes back. It's going to be such a big event. I don't believe God wants anybody to miss it. Now, you had a second question. Yeah. When you said, you said in the Bible, therefore, you also be ready. But how do I get ready? Trevor, you've asked the most important question anybody could ask. You get ready for that day by being ready now. And you're ready now by inviting Jesus into your life and welcoming him into your heart and choosing him as your Lord and Savior. If you've done that, then you are ready now. And that's as ready as you can be for the return of Jesus. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Trevor, Mom, really appreciate you joining us on Hope Awakens. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that was pretty awesome. Doug, you've got more questions too. Yes, this is one here. Since God can read our mind, is it okay to just talk to him in our mind instead of vocal? After all, I haven't been much of a talker. <laughs> However you want to communicate with God is okay with God. If it works for you to think your prayers, fine. If you want to say them, say them out loud. Whatever works is going to be quite okay. You know, when we pray, we often look down. Yet God is in heaven up there. Why shouldn't we look up there when we pray? Well, you can. Many people do look up when they pray. Uh, I don't know that it really matters nearly as much as which direction your head or your face is facing as much as which direction your heart is facing. If your heart is directed towards heaven, now you're in good shape when you pray. How do we know there won't be any more sin after Lucifer, uh, Satan dies? 
Well, the Bible says in Nahum 1 and verse 7 that affliction will not arise again the second time. And we're told in the Revelation that nothing that defiles will enter into heaven. No sin, no way throughout eternity. Is Jesus also the Father? You said that Jesus is our brother and God is the Father. I'm a bit confused here. Uh, don't be confused. Jesus is not the Father. He's the Son. The Father is the Father. Jesus taught us to pray to our Father in heaven. So the Father is the Father. Jesus isn't that. He's our brother, if you like, but he's our Lord and our Savior. So remember that. That's the key thing. Aaron from Ireland asks, in the story of the Tower of Babel, it says that all of the workers started speaking a new language. Do you know what the original language was? And will we be speaking that language in heaven? No, I don't know. And I don't know. But maybe if we're blessed, whatever language we speak, we'll speak with a beautiful Irish accent. Greetings in Ireland, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. Because Roman law forbade the Jews from killing Jesus, they coerced Pontius Pilate to do their dirty work for them. How then was the Sanhedrin able to stone Stephen to death just three years later? Were the Jews violating Roman law or had something changed here? Yeah, yes, they were. They were violating Roman law. That's what they were doing. They were, they were, out, of, they were, out, of, they were out of bounds doing what they did, but they went ahead and did it anyway. Josh would like to know, is it necessary to close your eyes when you pray? It is for me, Josh, absolutely, because if I don't, I'm distracted by everything going on around me. You know, it's so interesting uh, in a setting where people are supposed to pray, but they're looking around and they close your eyes. There's no Bible command that says close your eyes, but you'll be distracted if you don't. Unless, of course, you're driving and you're on the phone and someone prays, don't close your eyes then. But otherwise, eh. Do what works, but it's really hard to imagine you can pray and focus with your eyes open. Here's a very interesting one, John. I was taught that if I'm lying in bed asleep with my husband, when Jesus comes, only one of us will go to be with Jesus. Is this correct if a husband and a wife are both believers? No, that's not correct. And both you and I are relieved by that. No matter whether you're asleep, awake, in bed, out of bed. When Je but by the way, when Jesus comes back, we're all going to be awake. Don't worry about that. That will have our attention. You said in an answer to the question about year zero from BC to AD, that BC ended at Christ's death. I was always under the impression that BC ended at Christ's birth, especially since you said he was baptized in 27 AD, which would put his death in 30 or 31 AD. Yeah, that's correct. Jesus died in 31 AD. I don't believe I said that BC began at the death of Jesus. If I did, that was a mistake. Um, but I, I doubt that very much. Uh, B.C. began when it began. As a matter of fact, if you look at the chronology, Jesus was born in about 3 or 4 B.C., which is odd. That's because somebody drew the line before they really figured out the chronology. It doesn't make a bit of difference. Here's a question from Russia. If the Bible is so clear that God is, is the creator of the universe and most leaders of our countries claim to believe in God, why then are we taught about evolution and the Big Bang theories in school? Would it be right to say then that the conspirator, the devil, has got hold of our political leaders and our educational system? Well, first, I'm thrilled that you're joining us from Russia. Welcome. I'm, I'm really glad. Now, you've got to be careful because if I say the wrong thing, it's going to make it sound like that all of our educators and politicians are under the control of the devil, and that wouldn't be true. What we do know is that evolution is a specious teaching. It is not biblical. It is faulty. It's not, er it's not, not true. We're talking about Darwinian evolution. Uh, yeah, that's a victory that the devil has won for now, getting that into schools and getting creation out of schools. Never mind. Teach the truth at home. Um, that's, that's important for Christians to do that. How do you know if it's God's will to do something? Yeah, all right. Because the Bible will back it up because uh, people you trust may well agree with what the Bible says. Of course, that's not primary, that's secondary. Abraham was asked by God to go and sacrifice his son. Why did he do it? It's because he knew God and he knew the voice of God. So when God said, off you go, he said, that's God speaking. I'll go. You get to know God well enough and you'll know his voice whenever he speaks. Maybe one more question. Okay, this is a good one. How would you respond to someone who says that they have their own belief? They read the Bible, they pray, and they don't want to hear anything else. I would respond graciously, I hope. Pray for that person. Look for opportunities to share. Uh, if they don't want to learn about the Bible, then teach them about something else. Share something else. Look to build a bridge so that later on you can introduce Jesus to that person. But if somebody's sh shutting you out, then you need to respect that. 
but pray and see if God can find you another path to the heart. Doug, thank you very much. Thank you. Very Greatly good. appreciate it. And thank you for your questions. Hopeawakens.org is where you can submit your questions. Now, our guest tonight, Dr. Roger Schwelt. He's a pulmonologist, a critical care specialist, and a sleep specialist based in Redlands, California. His videos on COVID-19 and the coronavirus pandemic have been watched millions of times. That's not an exaggeration on YouTube. It's really a blessing to welcome to Hope Awakens, Dr. Roger Schwelt. Dr. Schwelt, thank you for taking your time. Thank you, John. Okay, we've been speaking about, and when I say we, I mean that in the very broad sense, about how to approach good health and uh, good health practices in relation to the pandemic. Where does sleep fit into all of this? Sleep is extremely important, uh, John. Uh, everyone's talking about antibodies right now. Antibodies are your body's way of neutralizing the virus. And it shows that there's been a reaction from the immune system. And this is what all the blood tests are all about, is seeing whether or not you have antibodies. Well, you know, a number of years ago, they did a test where they took about 25 healthy subjects that hadn't had a flu shot, and they subjected half of them to sleep deprivation to see what would happen to them in terms of after they got a vaccine. Well, wouldn't you know that the ones that were sleep deprived had half the levels of antibodies than their counterparts that got a full night of sleep. And it shows how, how tightly the immune system is dependent on sleep. Absolutely. Those are, those are numbers that grab us and we, we can't ignore them. Now, broadening that, so that speaks to defense against the, the virus in question. How about generally? What are some things about sleep that we need to know? Yes. So sleep is imperative in terms of good health. Um, ironically, there's kind of a bell-shaped distribution in terms of if you look at how long people sleep and their health. Um, sometimes people can be so ill that it causes them to sleep a very long time. And we notice high mortality with that. And that's kind of an outlier. But generally speaking, as people get more and more hours of sleep up to about seven to eight, nine hours for an adult, there's a number of categories where their health improves, cardiovascular, neurological, psychological, uh, a number of factors where their health improves. Now, when you go to sleep, there are different phases of sleep. There are, there's the sleep that you experience at the beginning of the night. This is what we like to call slow wave sleep because of how it looks on the EEG. Towards the end of the night, you get a different type of sleep, generally speaking, a sleep called REM sleep, which you may have heard about. That stands for rapid eye movement sleep. The, the sleep at the beginning of the night is a slow wave sleep. This is more physically restorative, they find. It's associated with growth hormone, and, um, and, and the body physically is restored. Towards the end of the night with REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, this is a more mentally restorative sleep. And if you go to bed too late, your body might never actually get into this type of sleep. Now I heard you say seven, eight, nine hours. That's what's recommended for an adult, is that correct? Yeah, at least seven hours. Um, the, the range is between seven and nine hours for an adult. Now, if you go less than that, teenagers, school-age kids, the numbers go up. How about these people who say, I can get by on four, four and a half, five hours a night? Can they really? You know, interestingly, as you get older, you are able to deal with sleep deprivation better. And so it's very possible that you may not know how well you could feel unless you actually got seven, eight, nine hours of sleep per night. So it's very subtle. You may not even realize that you're being sleep deprived. Now, let me ask you this question. What about, or is there a connection between sleep and rest and a person's spiritual well-being? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, I, I look at it like a pyramid. Um, the stuff at the bottom is stuff that we, we, we know and we can feel. That is cardiovascular health. That is um, even mental health. But how are we supposed to do the icing on the cake? How are we supposed to have that connection with God, if our mind is not clear, if if we're not thinking correctly, we all know. I mean, as as a physician and and as people who take call will know, once you've done an all nighter in the hospital because you've had to because there's been a sick patient, 
you are not in a good position to be doing anything complicated uh, the next day. And certainly a communion with God and a spiritual connection requires that all of those systems are working well to really optimize that connection. People say, but I'm a night person. I do all my good stuff at night after 11 o'clock and until 2 or 3 a.m. How do you answer those people? Because you know, they're convinced. You know, it's very, it's very interesting that you say that. I used to think that as well. There is new emerging research that slow wave sleep may be the holy grail, if you will, of, of, uh, of good health. It's attached to growth hormone. And I, I could not believe this because I saw this recently in a scientific journal and they said that uh, the, the hours before midnight were the most important hours of the night. And for those of you that might know, that's, uh, uh, that is a familiar saying to many of us uh, who know uh, the literature. Well, very important insights. I'm grateful that you took the time to share them. Dr. Schwelt, uh, by the way, before you go, uh, tell folks how they can find you on YouTube because your, your videos there about uh, COVID-19 have been watched millions and millions of times. What's the best way to find you? Yeah, so if you go to YouTube, just type in MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M, and you'll find uh, numerous videos uh, on COVID-19 and others, or you could go to MedCram.com and see them there as well. Fantastic. Really appreciate you. Appreciate your work and your ministry. Thank you for taking time with us tonight, Dr. Roger Schwelt. Thank you. What a blessing to have him join us, and I hope you're encouraged. Uh, by the way, I, I think I can suggest there's one thing that's almost guaranteed to make sure people get some sleep because whenever I get up to speak before a congregation and preach a sermon, inevitably someone over here and somebody back there and maybe someone seems to help every time. So hang in there with me. We're about to pray with our eyes closed and we're going to dig into the Bible and, and trust that God will speak to us. Come on, let's pray now. Father in heaven, it's been good already. Thank you for encouraging us in many ways. Now I pray as we come to your words, speak to us and let this encounter with you be everything for us that you wish. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Half an hour or so northeast of Manhattan, New York City, on the banks of the Hudson River is the little town of Irvington, New York. Residents past and present make up something of a who's who list. Irvington has been the home to John Jacob Astor, at the time the wealthiest man in the United States, to Sun Myung Moon, and to all sorts of people in between. Today, Irvington is home to Rip Van Winkle, or at least a statue of Rip Van Winkle. It's located across the road from the fire station on Main Street. Rip Van Winkle was the, was the creation of author Washington Irving. Irvington was named in his honor. Irving wrote the story in 1819. In the story, a man falls asleep in the Catskill Mountains, somewhere Irving said he'd never even been, and he wakes up 20 years later to find that he has missed the American Revolution and that his little village has changed. Now, as important as sleep is, that might just be overdoing it. In fact, the Bible says something interesting about sleep. This is Proverbs 20 and verse 13. Do not love sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. Now, really, that's an injunction against laziness. Proverbs 26, 14 says, as a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. The next verse says, the lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth, which is almost comical, really. But it's important to get sleep. Losing sleep can cause hallucinations and psychosis and long-term memory impairment. Some studies have linked uh, sleep deprivation to chronic conditions like hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, and bipolar disorder. Japanese researchers found that sleep deprivation has profound effects on the immune system. People who get less than six hours sleep a night have a higher risk of coronary heart disease, their blood pressure is higher, their cholesterol is worse, and those who consistently don't get enough quality sleep are 60% more at risk of having a heart attack, high blood pressure, or a stroke. Poor sleep habits can even change your DNA by impacting the signals that control how our genes operate on a day-to-day -day basis. You see, each one of us has a circadian clock. It uses basically a 24-hour rhythm and coordinates with the Earth's light-dark cycle. That word circadian, it comes from two Latin words, circa, meaning about, and diem, meaning day. 
light sensitive cells in your eyes send information to your brain's master clock, which readjusts daily. That master clock regulates temperature and eating patterns, all sorts of things going on in your body. And then cellular clocks throughout your body react so they can be in tune with the master clock. When you continually mix that up, the result can be chronic degenerative diseases. So apparently getting enough rest is important. It seems it's also important for the world to get rest. That's a biblical concept. In Exodus 23, God said, six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. The next book of the Bible after Exodus is Leviticus. And in chapter 25, God said, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Evidently it was good for the land to get rest, to rejuvenate. This was in a time before people understood crop rotation and modern agricultural practices. It's clear this rest was designed to help the poor and also to curb materialism, to put a check on the gaining of wealth. Now think about what's going on in the world right now. Have you seen the photos of some of the world's major cities showing how pollution is disappearing? Cities like New Delhi, India, where their air pollution is truly hideous. Now there's clean air as though Delhi was transported to the Swiss Alps. Pollution levels have dropped precipitously in China. It's, in, it's, it's a wonder to behold how we've gone from dirty air to clean air. In Venice, Italy, fish are back swimming in the canals. Animals are reappearing in places where they're not usually seen. And of course, that's in most cases due to there being far fewer people about. It seems that even nature enjoys a rest. So we understand sleep. We understand coyotes hanging around the Golden Gate Bridge, seeing as they've got the place to themselves now. But what about emotional rest, mental rest? What about spiritual rest? What about the problem of stress, where so many people are slaves to the go, go, go creed to which this world adheres? What can we do to quiet the inner turmoil, the lack of inner peace? the gnawing sense of futility that so often accompanies so much of what we do. Where can a person find real meaning in their lives? In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. World Happiness Report. It ranks 156 countries by how happy their citizens perceive themselves to be. Supported by the University of Oxford and other major organizations. The cities at the bottom of that list, Kabul, Afghanistan, Sana'a in Yemen, Gaza, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and Juba in South Sudan. And we could understand why. Big challenges there. The five happiest cities in the world, and this is this year, number one, Helsinki, Finland. Number two, Aarhus, Denmark. Number three, Wellington, New Zealand. Number four, Zurich, Switzerland. And number five, Copenhagen in Denmark. Highest ranking Australian city, Brisbane, came in number 10. Highest ranking city in the United States, Washington, D.C., which almost inexplicably ranks number 18th globally. Now, these are subjective. This is how people see themselves. But look at how David saw himself when he wrote in Psalm 16 and verse 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Fullness, fullness of joy, where? In the presence of God. Remember how God designed it all. Adam and Eve evidently spoke with God face to face. After sin, 
God asked that a sanctuary be built so that he could dwell in the midst of his people. Jesus was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the God of heaven isn't aloof. He's not remote. He isn't distant. He wants to be with us, which means he wants the closest relationship possible. And right back at creation, God did something to ensure that he and we would have an unbroken bond, a connection. God did something to show us that he would always have time for us and to encourage us to make time for him. The Bible starts with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. On the first creation day, God made light, saying, let there be light. And there was light. On day two, God made the sky and the sea. Day three, the land and vegetation. Day four, the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, sea creatures and birds. On day six, animals and people. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible record is clear. We were carefully designed. We were crafted by a great creator God. We're all aware that there's controversy about that in some circles. The idea of creation calls for you to exercise faith. Well, how did a God just create everything that we see? Well, if you believe he was able to bring water out of a rock or feed thousands of people with a little boy's lunch, this is not too much for you. If you have faith in the Bible, you'll have read where it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. You find that in Psalm 33. How did God create the universe? He spoke. He spoke and it came into existence. Is that hard to believe? No harder than believing that an eye is the result of evolution. The eye is made up of more than 2 million working parts. The retina in a human being has approximately 6 million cones and 120 million rods. One eye. Those 120 million rods are photoreceptors, light receivers. The 6 million cones see color. They're divided into red, green, and blue. The eye is a camera, an extremely good one. And you can imagine that just coming into existence on its own. Can you? Even Charles Darwin wrote in his book, The Origin of Species, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest sense. Since Darwin sailed around the world on the HMS Beagle in the first half of the 1830s, the idea of evolution has become more and more popular. With it, the concept of God as creator and even of God as God has really been damaged. And let's ask why that is. It's not that people have become more intelligent. It's not because of better education. It's because there is a deliberate campaign going on in the universe to undermine Jesus and to separate our hearts from God. It happened in heaven. It happened in the Garden of Eden. And it has been going on ever since. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the creator. John 1, starting in verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I know there are a lot of thinking, intelligent, even God-fearing people who've taken hold of evolutionary theory. I'd like to encourage you tonight to instead take hold of the Bible. It's not fundamentalism. It isn't crankiness. It isn't old-fashioned. It's simply faith in God. So God created for six days, but even though Adam and Eve had been created, creation wasn't yet finished. Genesis 2 verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. God was not tired, but ceasing from that work and enjoying his completed creation. He gave us a memorial of his creative power. 
Memorials are good. They help us to remember here, God gave us a memorial of his power to create and recreate. A memorial to help us to remember who God is, the creator and who we are, his children, the works of his hands. Genesis 2 verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. What an amazing concept. Right back at creation, God built into the calendar a time for rest and recovery. His idea was that we would take a day out, time out, that we would shut out the reloaded, set it aside. He made clear it was a special day. And what's really interesting about this is that it's all tied together with God's last day gospel message. The message he says will go to the entire world before everything is done. Revelation 14, starting in verse six. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of waters. Now you saw that worship him who made that's worship Jesus at a time in the stream of time when the whole world will be following after a different power, according to the book of Revelation. And God says, take time out. Remember the Sabbath day. I've set time aside for you and me to get together, to commune, to spend in each other's presence. In fact, this creation week, six days of creation and then a day of rest, is the reason we have a seven-day week at all. Our week today harkens back to the first week of the world, the creation week right back at the very beginning. God showed us how special this day is. He blessed it. He sanctified it. He rested on it. He was careful to show us he was making this day a special day. Imagine if people put the brakes on life just enough to set a day aside for God. You think we'd have nearly the problems we have in the world right now? If people were mindful of God and of their relationship to him, and this was important to God, he included this in the Ten Commandments. He wrote those with his own finger on tables of stone. God wanted this for us. And as he doesn't force our will, God was hoping we would want it for us as well. And when God gave the commandments, he spoke a little differently about this one. This wasn't a thou shalt or a thou shalt not. God started this one by saying, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor into all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. That's Exodus chapter 20. So clearly this wasn't new. This couldn't be something that they were not familiar with. God said, remember, the Sabbath was given in the Garden of Eden and his people had incorporated this into their lives ever since. And you'll notice the wording God uses. He indicates how important this is. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Notice that. It's not the Sabbath of this person or that person. It's not the Sabbath of the Jews or of the Gentiles. It's God's day. The originator of the Sabbath is the creator himself. The Sabbath wasn't just reserved for one race of people. It's not a Jewish institution any more than thou shalt not kill was reserved only for Jews or thou shalt not commit adultery. The Sabbath was created by God 2,300 years before the existence of the Jewish race. Exodus 20 verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So is this for us today or is it simply a relic of a bygone era? Thankfully, it's for us today too. Where did anyone get the idea that God would say to people back then, 
you'll get a blessing, you get to rest, you get to spend the special time with God, but you poor souls down there in the 21st century, not for you. No, this is one of the 10 commandments. Now, don't think people do this in order to be saved. The rule we're remembering is people who have encountered God will love to do God's will. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. That's God saying this is given by him to us for a special purpose. He's saying the Sabbath is a sign that God makes us holy. In other words, it's a sign that God is the creator and the recreator. Look at how Jesus modeled this. Luke 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth. This is Jesus, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So which day should be kept as the Sabbath day? There are seven days in a week. Is one just as good as another? Well, we'll find out what the Bible recommends. In Luke chapter 23, we read this. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Luke 24 verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Now here's what we know. Jesus died on the preparation day. We call that Good Friday. He rose on the first day of the week. You might call that Easter Sunday. And he rested on the day in between, which was the Sabbath, the day we would call today in English, Saturday. Right there between Friday and Sunday, boom, the Sabbath. Even your dictionary will tell you that Sunday is the first day of the week. Oh, yes, it is. But Saturday is the seventh day of the week. In Spanish, Saturday is sábado. In Russian, subota. In Italian, sábado. Many languages of the world simply use the word Sabbath for Saturday. On that first ever Sabbath, Jesus rested from his work of creation. And after he died on the cross, he rested on the Sabbath from his work of redemption. Now, some confusing things get said about this. And I'd like you to be thinking about why that might be. Someone will say, ah, but we're not under the law, which you well know is 100% true. Even though we're not under the law, we still want to do God's will. I don't know many people who think that they're not under the law, so therefore they should drive through the downtown at 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour. We do right because Jesus lives his life in us, not because we're trying to prove anything to God. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. It's so important to God. He wrote it with his own finger on tables of stone, not something he wants us to forget. Someone said these are the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. The Sabbath is a memorial of creation, just like the 4th of July or another holiday, national holiday would be a memorial. And you can't change that. You wouldn't want to. Those memorials exist to remind us that something was done by someone special. We know that Jesus observed the Sabbath. Why did he do that? He said in John 15, 10, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And remember, Jesus as the lawgiver and as the creator instituted the Sabbath on this earth. So did God make any changes to this 
when Jesus died? Well, the best way to find out is to look at the example of Jesus' followers. What did they do after Jesus had died? Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preached to you is the Christ. This is Paul. He believes in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he's remembering the Sabbath day. Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Acts chapter 13, starting in 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. I want you to notice, these were Jews. And then Gentiles, non-Jews, they weren't beholden to Jewish worship practices, but they knew that corporate worship happened on the Sabbath. And that's why they mentioned that. If there'd been some kind of change, they would have said, let's do this any old time. Acts 13, 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. This was in Antioch. So we see where God says he has something special for us, a gift. In fact, in fact, Jesus says in Mark 2 that the Sabbath was made for man, that's humankind, and not man for the Sabbath. It was made for you. And those are the best gifts, aren't they? Where someone made something for you makes it special. God made this gift for you, and it's special. You know, I remember hearing someone say, the Sabbath isn't in the New Testament. Well, we've already seen it was right there in the book of Acts, but let me show you this. Looking in the Bible, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, and he says to the people, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem took place in the year 70 AD. As a matter of fact, the magnificent Colosseum in Rome, that was funded, it was paid for by the spoils taken from the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So that anchors this thing in time. Looking ahead four decades to 70 AD, Jesus said, the Sabbath will still be important to you then. So no, there was never any change made, nor would there be any need for one. Now, what might cause confusion is that when Jesus died on the cross, he brought an end to the system of types and ceremonies, which for thousands of years had pointed to his death on the cross. A transition took place away from the ceremonies and towards eternal realities. The ceremonial law was no longer to be kept. No more animal sacrifices, no more annual feast days. But the Ten Commandments, well, of course, they are still important to God. The Bible tells us that a day starts and ends at sunset. So the Sabbath day is, is observed from sunset to sunset, from sunset Friday, to sunset Saturday, you get to push a release valve. You get to exhale. You get to rest deeply in the love and goodness of God, knowing that he is your maker and you are his child. You push aside secular responsibilities for a day. So we know the Sabbath was given at creation, kept by the followers of God, honored by Jesus, kept by his followers after his death. Come on now, let's take this thing one step further. In Isaiah 66, you read, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that's from month to month, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The Sabbath day will even be kept in the new earth long after we go to heaven. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. If we're going to worship God as created throughout eternity, 
It seems logical we should worship him as creator here. We recognize God as creator because, because he is the creator. We recognize God as God because he made us in the beginning. This is what separates the true God from false gods. In the beginning, God created. He gives us the Sabbath day to remember that, to live in relation with him based on that principle. We don't want to just know that God has given it to us. We want to know why he's given it to us. He's our maker and he knows best. I'm thankful God extends this Sabbath to us as a gift today. Workaholics get a chance to take a break. Families get a chance to regroup. God says this busy life is going to push you. It's going to push you to overdo it. So take a deep breath, step back, rest a little. This is quality time, quality time with God, time for worship. It's time with family, quality time uninterrupted by regular concerns and our secular work. Time made holy by the creator for us to enjoy his presence and grow in his love. Remember what David said? In God's presence is fullness of joy and we're not getting enough of it. And we're missing so much if we are ignoring the blessing of the Sabbath. Yes, the earth needs to be managed carefully. That's correct. But we need to guard ourselves spiritually as well. And God says, this is for rest and recovery. Now, I want you to think about what this says about God. It means that God wants to enhance our lives. He wants to bless us with more of his presence. He wants us to be happier than we've been. He wants to be the focus of our lives like never before. God wants you to get the most out of life. That's why he says, he is a special gift. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, spend time with me. Now, I know that somebody might say, I will keep every day holy. Now, I know what you mean. You want to love God, serve God, worship God every day. That's right. Amen to that. But God hasn't asked us to keep every day holy. We can only keep something holy that God has made holy. Now, I don't want you to think that the fourth commandment is somehow more important than the others. But the problem is that most people seem to think it's less important than the others. If you're breaking one, it hurts the Lord as much as you're breaking another. James 2 verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Remember, Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He wasn't saying, if you love me, go and prove it. He was saying, if you love me, something wonderful is going to happen in your life. I think we'd make a mistake if we thought about this only as a matter of breaking God's law. The problem is when we ignore the commandments of God, we break God's heart. God is wanting to add to your experience with him. You don't want to make the mistake of saying, that's not what I've done all my life. I'm not about to change now. Really? Instead of that, how about you pray and ask God to make clear his will for your life? The Christian who loves God wants God's will to be done. You know, when smartphones were introduced, not very many people said they wanted to stick with the old rotary phone on the wall of their home. When I was a child, you know, my mother had an agitator washing machine. The thing had a ringer, which you need to be wary of. But my mother didn't decide that she would stick with the old agitator washing machine forever. She moved with the times. That's appropriate. Does God want us to make progress spiritually? Oh, yes, of course he does. Sometimes he shows us new things because he wants more for us. And we're always happier when we grow in our faith in God. You listen to this and you realize that God wants more for you. He wants to bless you more. Back in 1975, a man who worked on the assembly line at the Fiat Auto Factory in Turin in Italy stopped on his way home from a police auction where items found on city trains were sold to the highest bidder. Now, the man spotted two paintings. He saw them. He said, they look nice on the wall above our kitchen table. The auctioneer told him they were garbage, 
found on a train that ran between Paris and Turin in Italy's Northwest. So the man bid and bid and bid and the bidding went up. He outbid another man and he paid oof, the princely sum of about $30. After the man retired, his son, who was taking an art appreciation class, discovered one of the paintings was by the French painter Pierre Bonnard and the other was by Paul Gauguin. They were originals. They're worth around $50 million. And because insurance had paid out and the original owners had no heirs, the retired auto worker got to keep his paintings, bought at auction for 30 bucks. And now they're worth 50 million. They were there on his wall all those years, but unappreciated for what they really were. He didn't know the value of what he had. The Sabbath has been there all the time, but many people have simply never realized the value of what they have. Now we know. A special day, blessed by God, quality time, time God wants to spend with you. We know we've got something precious in Jesus. He gives us the good gifts. And Jesus is coming back soon to take us home. Come on, let me pray with you now. Dear Father in heaven, you are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you for this one. And I pray that as we take hold of it and welcome it into our lives, you will bless us and grow us. Prepare us for the day when Jesus comes back, we pray with thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Remember, Remember to go to, to hopeawakens.org and get, get our resources, resources there, there and tonight's tonight special, special gift, gift book. book. See you, See for, you more for more next time, next time on, on Hope, Hope Awakens. Awakens. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in to our Lincoln Northside YouTube channel. We're so glad that you stopped by, and we are so glad to be participating in this Hope Awakens series put on by It Is Written and presented by John Bradshaw. If this has been a blessing to you, I invite you to share this with friends, but there's a very important announcement I want to reiterate that John just shared on the broadcast. You uh, should register, if you haven't already, at hopeawakens.org, hopeawakens.org. I'll go ahead and throw that up on our uh, screen here for you so you can write that down and we're gonna be putting it in the comments chat as well so that you can have an active link to go ahead and click right away. Uh, you'll want to register so that you have the full interactive value of this evangelistic series. Uh, it's a beautiful opportunity to be able to um, interact uh, the, the books that John would like to send to you, uh, assistance that John has who will contact you to pray with you, to journey with you, to have discussions with you. Uh, so you'll want to register at hopeawakens.org uh, so that you can watch uh, the upcoming series. We'll we'll have them here on our YouTube channel as well, but we want to encourage you to look at it there also and to be able at least to register and get into some interactive opportunities through that registration. If you have any suggestions for our particular church or if you want to get in touch with us, uh, the Lincoln Northside and Holland District of Churches here in southeastern Nebraska in the Lincoln area, uh, if you're in this area or you want to get in touch with our our church through our YouTube channel as you've been watching. Uh, there's another link that you can make use of here that I'll show for you. It is um, a connect card that we like we'd like to use to get in touch with those this who've been tuning in Hope to Awakens. our channel. So thanks for being I, uh, part of thank you so much for again watching our channel finances. and thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us to interact with you and to um, share in this moment together. So uh, again, we want to encourage you to stick around for future broadcasts, but very importantly also consider uh, registering at hopeawakens.org, hopeawakens.org. Once again, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Pastor Daniil. I have the privilege of pastoring the Lincoln Northside and Holland churches. Uh, and that, as I mentioned earlier, is in the southeastern Nebraska area, in the Lincoln area. Uh, we are delighted to be able to bring this broadcast to you. We will continue streaming these. And if this has been a blessing to you, register or contact us through the Connect card that I just showed you, and let's stay in touch. Uh, the next seminar happens tomorrow night. The next presentation is tomorrow night. We'll have it here, or you might watch it live at hopeawakens.org. And then this coming Saturday, there will be a morning 
um, a morning broadcast at 10 a.m. So we'll come on air on this YouTube channel at 9.30, and then at 10 o'clock, John Bradshaw is going to be presenting a sermon there. So we'll a sermon here on our channel, so you'll want to join us for that as well. Thank you again for your, uh, for your presence, and we will see you on our next broadcast. God bless.